What we have is the end of last year, total global debt was 390 odd trillion trillion dollars versus a GDP last year of 102 trillion. We have had a decade of, in real terms, basically negative interest rates. What does that do? It creates a lot of speculation. It creates greed. And now with the Fed followed by other Western central banks having decided that they really had made very big mistakes and they better do something about bringing interest rates up to a real level. Problem is that as we have seen in a highly leveraged system, when you go from rates basically, real rates basically zero to nominal rates at three, four percent, and in some cases where you're in uh, sectors like the construction industry, you're probably paying seven to eight percent. All of a sudden, what you felt was was going to be zero rates forever no longer exists. Mm. And that causes huge issues. And the second issue is that the banks from 2020 onwards loaded themselves with this supposedly safe stuff, the government bonds yielding practically nothing. And now the government bonds are yielding something and the prices have gone down. So globally, something like 800, 850 billion. If the prices were marked to market, the banks would have lost that amount of money. So you've got a highly fragile global system. And the question is, the real question is, where are rates going to go? Because that is going to determine when the next round of bank failures and credit uh, crises are going to occur. We think that probably 10-year treasuries are yielding something like, I don't know exact figure, something like 3.2, 3.3. will probably be yielding 5% by the middle of this year. So that, that's not in the market. The market is saying, oh, yields are falling. Great. But there's this rear view forecasting. It's not looking, not looking at where the car is traveling down the road. So 5% is going to cause, and that should happen around the middle of the year, that's going to cause the next wave of crises. Quite what they're going to be, who knows? But there's no question, there'll be crises. So with rates rising and actually real money supply, which had a pickup in the first quarter, has, is now going negative again. And that tells you something that uh, where is global business going to go? It's going to go downhill. Negative real money supply and rising interest rates is going to lead into a recession. And in the United States, people point towards the strong employment data. But actually, if you look at the forward indicators, it's, 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 it's got very weak. So recession is going to be around the corner. At the same time, around the middle of the year, the war in the Ukraine will intensify with a big, big risk that it actually goes over the borders of Ukraine. I think this is a huge risk. And then you've got growing, in this part of the world, growing tensions between Israel and Iran, nothing new. But Iran has stated that they've got enriched uranium to over 90%, which brings them close to having a bomb. You've got huge domestic problems, political problems in Iran. The United States and um, Israel have been conducting simulation attacks on Iran. And that was a month or so ago. So I, I think, I mean, this is not a forecast. It's one of the risks that we have to watch very carefully. There's a big, big risk that Israel will attack Iran. Problem is that Iran is fully prepared for this. They have acquired the latest anti-ship missiles from uh, Russia and China. According to my local sources, they have actually chosen the two super tankers to sink in the narrow part of the channel to prevent any shipping going in or out. And if that happens, you're going to blow up the global derivative market. Think of the strategic alliances that Iran has developed with China and Russia. So if you attack Iran, you are attacking China and Russia. It's happening. It's evolving. People are not recognizing it. You've had the Iranian president in, in, in Moscow. You've had the rapprochement orchestrated by Beijing between Saudi and Iran. Uh, you've got Assad from Syria being brought into the Arab fold again. You've got Qatar is being brought in as well. Turkey is being brought in. Behind the scenes, there is an awful lot going on that the president this year of BRICS is the president of South Africa. So don't tell me that some African countries are not going to join BRICS. Uh, 
we know that the Gulf countries have indicated a willingness to join. You've got uh, Lulu back as president of Brazil. Uh, he is a very active, always has been a very active supporter of BRICS. You have the ex-finance minister of Brazil, now is the uh, president of the BRICS Development Bank. You have India and Russia doing huge oil and other trade deals together without the dollar. By the way, the UAE currency, the dirham, has been used in that in those transactions. You have had Saudi Arabia selling a tanker or two of oil to China, receiving RMB. What did they do with the RMB? They bought gold on the uh, Shanghai Gold Exchange. You had the UAE selling 65, no, 62,000 tons of LNG to China, receiving RMB. What they did with the RMB, I don't know, but I would guess the same thing. Buy gold through the Shanghai Gold Exchange. The big deal has been between Russia and China. Russia has a very large trade surplus with China for the sale of energy and, and raw, other raw materials. What are they doing with the surplus? It's held in a gold differential account in the PBOC. And probably that is the template of what will happen between China and, and the GCC countries. So gold is, has already come back as a medium of exchange. And if we're going back to BRICS, the original plan drawn up by the Russian economist who is in charge of developing the new currency, originally it was going to be a combination of the weighted average of member currencies and the value of the commodities that members produce, but valued not in dollars, but in gold. But there are more recent indications that they're going to make it much simpler. The ruble and the one will be convertible into gold. By, say, 2026, 2027, the dollar index will have halved in value. Neither Russia nor China want their currencies to be the reserve currency. Yeah. Their whole philosophy is a multinational environment. So <clears throat> you will trade in a gold convertible currency or you will trade within your own currencies without going through the dollar. Why go through the dollar? I mean, interestingly, what's Ghana done? Ghana has a lot of gold and Ghana needs to import. So instead of having to build a dollar reserve to pay for its oil imports, if you want, we want oil, we give you gold. The global financial system will collapse in 2025. By, by then, you'll have long-term 10-year treasuries yielding over 10%. What is that going to do to a highly leveraged global financial system? That's what will lead to depression. And in the depression, A, the BRICS will come out with their new currency, and B, the Western countries will come up with a digital currency, mm -hmm. which is just as worthless mm -hmm. as it's a paper currency, but in digital form. Within five years, maybe within two years, the way the pace at which this is going is really going to cover the bulk of the world's commodity markets. So if you turn on its head, Secretary's, Treasury Secretary Connolly's remark decades ago, the dollar is your problem. The BRICS are now then going to say, commodities are your problem. The prices of the commodities are going to collapse too. I mean, if you take copper, we've got a short-term correction down to about $6,500. But with the, by the autumn, with the Fed and other central banks looking at failures within the financial system, war over Ukraine intensifying, other hot spots, the dollar starting to fall sharply, they're going to turn the credit taps full on. So you then get some economic recovery, but in a highly inflationary environment, and in an inflationary environment, what does manufacturing do? First of all, it replenishes the inventories of everything that they have sold off. And then as, a, as their own inflation hedge, instead of holding a ton of copper, they'll hold two tons of copper, for instance. And then you will have the financial institutions. What do they do always when there is a falling dollar currency and rising inflation? They go long of commodities as their own hedges and long of equities. Your equity markets 
Well, probably by the autumn would have fallen by something like 30%. Then the Fed opens the taps full on to get what I call the last hurrah in global equities and in commodities. We're basically from the lows of the autumn of this year. They'll double by early 2025 or end of 2024. I think we could easily have a nice little correction over the next month or so. But on any correction, buy gold and hold it. Uh, if interest rate goes up, the shake people out. It's only short-term correction, but on a correction, you buy it. Interest rates will fall in the fourth quarter because we're in the recession and the central banks have opened the taps, blah, blah, blah. So probably we will see 10-year treasuries, which will have got up to 5% by mid-year, going down to 3.5%. But then by, certainly by early 2025, if not the end of 2024, they'd have shot up to over 10%. Crashing dollar, rising inflation. Inflation probably worse than what it was in 1981. You then had US CPI from memory at 13.5%. You've had the last five years, the amount of credit that global central banks have pushed into the economy was the equivalent, an annual equivalent of 47% of GDP, or something like, from memory, $43 trillion. That goes into every nook and can canny, cranny in the global economy. And then, we are going to have supply disruptions on oil. Mm -hmm. You'll see oil by the end of 2024, call it $150. But the big kicker is going to be food prices or weather-related reasons, other than the usual reasons of supply disruptions out of Russia to Ukraine and fertilizer shortages. But the game changer, we're going to either by the end of this year or next year, move into what's called the 89-year Glesberg weather cycle. And 89 years ago, that caused the Midwest Dust Bowl decade. Now is the time you should start contingency planning. Don't wait until the proverbial hits the fan. Start now. So for my personal, from you know, household's point of view, start saving a little bit more, have a nice stock of food, buy gold on weekdays, etc., etc., all the sensible things. Buy physical gold. The paper gold market will be blown up because there will come a point when the banks are over overrun by the physical market. BRICS Plus. I always call it BRICS Plus because they're continually getting new members. There's a very interesting... The Russian economist who's developing the, the new currency did an extremely good interview a few months ago. And one of the clauses in the new currency is that if an existing member or a new incoming member defaults on its loans to the Western world, either to individual banks or to World Bank, IMF, etc., they will not be debarred from joining BRICS. What does that tell you? If you are an indebted country that you're going to join BRICS, bye-bye. Thank you very much.